Okay, we shall start recording here, but we are talking inner hair cell loss, inner ear pathology. And this is the biggest topic in our disorders course. And so I'm glad we're getting to it now because we're going to spend probably two weeks on this particular section because it's so comprehensive. Most uh, ear, nose, and doctors work on middle ear and outer ear infections. In other words, they can heal that, they can fix it. Okay, medications with tympanograms and kids with tubes in the ears and otitis media and cerumen and all that crap is treatable. But when we're talking inner ear pathology, we are talking hair cell pathology. And when you're talking hair cell pathology, we are talking permanent. People can't fix that. There's only two treatments for inner ear pathology. And one is hearing aids. <laughs> and the other one is sometimes surgery, but that would be for the rare cases of Meniere's disease or eighth nerve tumor. Really, there's, you can't fix, and yet there's so many types of inner ear pathology. Think of noise-induced hearing loss, the second most common cause of hearing loss. Think of presbycusis, the number one cause of hearing loss. And so right here and now, if we look at our good old notes, we should look at page one in our notes, and you will see at the very beginning, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to share screen here because I want to underline and emphasize this particular point. When you're talking inner ear pathology, and you will see on my screen over here, audiometry, inner ear disorders, break this first paragraph down very carefully. Inner ear disorders cause sensory neural loss. They are by far the most common source of hearing loss, okay, hearing disorders. But now look what it says right under that bold face line. It says sensory refers to outer hair cells, which amplify and sharpen the traveling wave for soft input sounds. And it reads here, damage to outer hair cells results in mild to moderate sensory neural loss with pretty good speech discrimination, fair speech discrimination. And that, people, is the most, I'd say that's 95% of hearing loss, right there, those first two sentences. Sensory hearing loss. Break the word sensory neural into two words, sensory and neural. Sensory is outer hair cell pathology. Neural is inner hair cell pathology. Sensory loss usually precedes neural. Usually outer hair cells die first. Then the inner hair cells begin to go. So when you have a mild to moderate loss, like a sloping presbycusis with Mrs. Jones or Mr. McGillicuddy, chances are that person, if you were able to look into his or her cochleas, the damage would be to the outer hair cells. And the person under headphones would have pretty good speech discrimination. Say the word, blah, say the word, blah, say the word, blah, probably 80%. 80 to 9, not bad. But when you start getting into a severe hearing loss, like 70 dB thresholds, beyond that magic number of 50 to 60, 50 to 60 is the cutoff. When you get beyond that degree of loss, now you're talking damage to both populations of hair cells, okay? And when you've got both populations of hair cells dying, now Houston, you've got a problem. Because now you're, a, remember what the outer hair cells and inner hair cells do, okay? The outer hair cells, and now I will, uh, I will uh, what do you call it, share screen again or stop sharing screen. The outer hair cells amplify the traveling wave. Remember we said that? They amplify and they sharpen the peak of the traveling wave. Inners don't do that. Inners send info to the brain. Outers have no part in sending info to the brain. That's why on your midterm, I asked a couple of times, do the outer hair cells have anything to do with the acoustic reflex? No, got nothing to do with it. They're not a part of the acoustic reflex arc. The acoustic reflex arc is outer, outer, middle, inner hair cells of the inner ear, eighth nerve, brain stem, and then the seventh and fifth facial nerves attaching to the tensor tympani and stapedius muscles. Outer hair cells aren't there. Outer hair cells 
amplify soft sounds or soft traveling waves. They make them bigger and they sharpen the peak of the traveling wave so we can separate frequencies close together. Now, bring this home to clinic where you will be next year when you're working. You will find two people. They might have a, the same mild to moderate loss. Maybe both people have the sloping presbycusis. One person's word discrimination is 85%. The other person's word discrimination is 62%. Que pasa? How come? Well, if you could open up the cochleas, which is illegal, <laughs> but if you could, you would probably see in the person with the better speech discrimination, that person's outer hair cells would be the sole source of damage. The inners would be just fine. The person with the lousier speech discrimination, probably the damage would be to both sets of hair cells. So that poor person, that person's mild to moderate loss happened to be caused by a mixture of outer and inner hair cell pathology. That person would probably have absent acoustic reflexes too. Whereas the person with the better speech to scrim has perfectly normal inner hair cells, so that person will probably have acoustic reflexes. See how it all ties in? Speech discrimination is a voluntary behavioral test. Acoustic reflexes are a non-behavioral. You've got no part in deciding whether to have them or not. You, you, it's involuntary. It's a reflex, like crossing your legs and the doctor taps your knee with a hammer and your, your leg kicks out. It's a reflex. So the interesting thing about all of this is tying things together anatomically so that you understand the testing and you understand the pathology. It's really, uh, so the breaking down of the sensory versus neural is very important and I will continue reading here. Neural refers to inner hair cells and eighth nerve. Damage results in severe sensory neural loss and poor speech discrimination. They will have normal tympanograms but likely absent acoustic reflexes. And that's why last week and the week before, when we talked acoustic reflexes, we said as soon as the sensory neural loss gets to be more than 60, all of a sudden the acoustic reflexes are absent. Whereas if the hearing loss is 30, 40, you'll still have acoustic reflexes. They'll be at reduced sensation levels, but you'll still have them. Now, I will share screen here again because there's a part on, on this um, on this first page that we can kind of gloss over, but reading down with me, that first paragraph is very important. Okay, that, that, that's like a, like a summary of the situation. Now we move on down to the middle paragraph. And you can see though at the bottom here, severe sensory neural loss is a lot less common. Look what it says there. They can't hear without their hearing aids. So severe, but they're much easier to please with hearing aids. They're way they're easier. Hearing, huh? The hearing aids, they're deaf as posts. So the glass to them is half full. Whereas the mild to moderate, if you look at this, these guys are way harder to please with hearing aids because they can still hear without their hearing aids. <laughs> and those are the people that are, they want the bells and whistles. They want the hearing aids to wake them up in the morning and make coffee for them. I mean, they can't figure out how come the hearing aids aren't perfect. And yet <laughs> that's the guy who's going to come through your door the most often. So when you start getting severe sensory neural loss, they simply can't hear without the hearing aids. So the hearing aids are their lifeline. Now, middle paragraph here hereditary causes. I'm not going to ask a lot of information on this, okay? I want you to just take a peek at this. Just take a, take a read with me. Well, look what's highlighted there, and then we'll gloss right through it, okay? Unlike the first paragraph, this one you can kind of gloss over. Have a read, though. Each person has 22 pairs of chromosomes and has one pair of sex chromosomes, male or female, XX or XY. One chromosome from each pair is inherited from each parent. That's why you've got pairs. Pair, 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 pair. Sometimes parts are missing, and sometimes a person's got three instead of two. And that person has Down's syndrome. And trisomy. Look where it says there. When you see the word syndrome, 
syndrome. It means they can't quite figure it out. It's a cluster of problems. It's kind of like, hmm, yeah, Meniere's disease. Yep, the person gets dizzy, gets rotary vertigo, the person gets roaring tinnitus, and sensory neural loss. Hmm, it's a syndrome. It's a, they, they got like all these weird things happening, like a cluster. When you see the word gene, blue genes, no, genes, you've got 50,000 to 100,000 along each chromosome. And then you get dominant gene, recessive genes. Don't freak about it. I ain't going to ask a dang thing on a midterm about this. This is just there for your reading. A dominant gene when a gene from only one parent causes the hearing loss or causes the blue eyes or the whatever, you know. Each child that had, then has a 50% chance of inheriting the disorder. A dominant gene, when a gene from only one parent is required to make a trait shown. Recessive gene, that's when genes from both parents are required to make a trait known. And this is kind of interesting. Look at the, look where you got uh, X-linked traits. Now, this is funny. Look at color blindness. Men can be color blind. Women aren't. <laughs> Women are luckier. Women have, and I'll stop sharing for a second here. Women have two X chromosomes, X and X. So if one, chrome, one of those X's carries the gene for color blindness, the other X covers its ass. <laughs> Whereas men have a Y chromosome. They're missing one stick. One is an X. They have, they have the X but the other one is a Y. <laughs> They're missing one stick here. <laughs> so women can carry color blindness, men wear it. <laughs> I always think that's kind of interesting. You know, like, you know, women are actually the superior sex. Men are weaker. We die earlier. <laughs> Women live longer, you know. The guys are, are like oak trees, you know, they're, <clears throat> and then when things change, <clears throat> they die. Whereas women are like these reeds of grass that blow in the wind. Oh, I think I'll work at the restaurant, or oh, I think I'll work at the bank. They just sort of survive. They just, <laughs> I always think that kind of stuff is rather humorous to me. I don't know why. Just... So anyway, we will now start, we can move on down the page here. You can read about RH factor to your heart's content. That's okay. That's fine. I just That's out of Martin. That whole middle paragraph is out of Martin's textbook. And I believe I got it from the inner hair cell pathology thing. Anyway, but there are also people inherit hearing loss. Some people inherit. And usually inherited hearing loss is shaped like a smile. It's called a cookie bite. That's my sister has. So interesting. It's yeah. really weird. It's a, that hearing loss is, is rare. It's 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 a cookie bite hearing loss, and when someone has that, it's almost always hereditary. It's just like do da. Hair cells at the base of the cochlea are fine. Hair cells at the apex of the cochlea are fine. It's in the middle, which is a rare type of thing. If you look at non-hereditary causes of sensor, sensory neural loss. Rubella, when mother has German measles, the baby can be born with hearing loss. Cytomegalovirus, oh, yeah, yeah, CMV, a herpes virus that's often mild on the person who's got it, but the developing fetus has a 30% chance of sensory neural loss. And you'll see another breakdown here, perinatal hearing loss. That's during instead of prenatal perinatal, during hearing, during birth. Well, that's usually going to be anoxia. You know, when the, uh, uh, the baby's right. suffering from a lack of oxygen during birth, because the birth can maybe be very traumatic. Uh, look at this, trauma to head with forceps during delivery. Good grief. When the umbilical cord is wrapped around the baby's throat by some, or baby's born breech, feet first or so, Prenatal, perinatal, prenatal is before birth, perinatal during, postnatal is, of course, after you are born. Hereditary hearing loss is usually sensory neural. Can be any configuration or shape, but one shape commonly associated is the cookie bite. And there you have it.
And then you'll see Mondini syndrome. Now we can start talking, but uh, I'm going to now go to the PowerPoints and we will work our way, slowly work our way through. So now I'm going to pull up this PowerPoint slide here. Looking at the cochlea closely, we've got to make sure that we have our cochleas down in order to understand inner ear pathology. Very, very important. So taking a look at what would this be, the scala media. You're looking at the scala media of the cochlea, you'll notice it bordering but with Reissner's membrane and the basilar membrane. Notice Reissner's membrane is just a strip, just a, just a membrane. That's all it is. The basilar membrane is where things get complicated. You have your outer hair cells, your inner hair cells. You have your tectorial membrane laying on the top. You will note, if you could bring this picture closely, look at how the hairs of the inner hair cells do not touch. Only the hairs of the outers do. When the outers shrink, they pull the membrane down so that the inner hair cell hairs can get bent. When the sound causing the movement in the cochlea is more than 50 to 60 dB, there's enough fluid motion taking place to bend the hairs by themselves. But when the sound activating the cochlea is less, like 10, 15, 20, the outer hair cells are required to kick into action, shrinking, pulling that tectorial membrane down to shear or bend the hairs of the inner hair cells. These other cells are just supporting cells. And look at this, the stria vascularis. We will be talking about this when we talk about presbycusis because you can have presbycusis due to outer hair cell pathology, you can get presbycusis due to inner hair cell pathology, and you can get presbycusis due to stria vascularis pathology. There's three types of presbycusis for you, and they have different shapes on the audiograms, and they have different word recognition abilities. By far the most common presbycusis is due to damage of the outer hair cells, by far. All right, looking at this picture of the cochlea, look at how the, this is a picture I really like because it unrolls the cochlea and you can see it wider at the, at the base or the stapes, foot plate, oval window, and look at the apex. And I love this picture because it shows how the scala media, look at this, gets wider and wider as you move to the narrow apex of the cochlea. That, that tells everything. That tell, shows you why you, look at it, if you follow my cursor, you'll have one row of inner hair cells all along, and you will have five rows of outer hair cells here, four rows of outer hair cells here, and three rows of outer hair cells here. So when you always see three rows of outer hair cells, that's always showing you what's taking place at the base of the cochlea. But here, this picture also tells you why low frequencies stimulate the, the base, the apex of the cochlea. There's more mass. It has more mass and it's less stiff. And that's why low frequencies activate this area. High frequencies activate this area. How come? Because there's less mass and it's more stiff here. This is very important for the understanding of Meniere's disease, which we will cover later on. It has everything to do with the audiogram shape of Meniere's, which we will cover in this section. And it's to do with the physical properties of the cochlea, as is being shown here. And again, and look at this picture here. All review from anatomy, but it's important to make sure we've got this stuff down as we proceed into our pathologies. Look at this. You've got your foot plate of the stapes, and you'll see the arrows pushing fluid around the helicotrema, so the scala vestibuli, around the helicotrema, scala tympani, pushing the round window. When the stapes pushes in, the round window bulges. You have that horizontal movement. But how does that cause a vertical movement as is seen on the right here? 
All right, you, can you see that? Mm -hmm. The reason why a horizontal back and forth movement of the oval and round windows, why does that cause an up and down movement is because of this. Look, this is wider here and it gets narrow and goes to a point here. So when the stapes foot plate pushes in, you've got a buildup of pressure because all, all that, that fluid's got to move through this point. So you've got a pressure buildup. And because of that pressure buildup, something's got to give. And what gives is the scale of media. Look at, see the, the, the dotted lines? The scale of media, boom, boom. And it's going to do that at the base of the cochlea with high frequencies. And it's going to do that at the apex of the cochlea with low frequencies. Here it says on the, my thing, my internet connection is unstable. Yikes. Can you still hear me? <laughs> all right. So it's all about that helicotrema, as is shown on this large slide. You can see the narrow helicotrema circle with the red, with the red circle up top here. It's that pressure buildup that takes place that causes the scala media to bend at one section or another in the cochlea. And this slide is for your reading. This is showing you as well. Have a look here. Scala vestibuli gets narrower and narrower and narrower as you get to the helicotrema. And then you've got that. So that's why you have a pressure buildup. And so you can see this dotted line is showing you a traveling wave that's taking place in the middle. But this traveling wave might take place at the apex or it might take place at the base, depending if it's a low or high frequency. Get it? Got it? Very, very good, eh? So look, look at this picture here. Talk about complexity. Here's a word, information. Information, and I made the letters go down. Information. How long does it take to say the word information? Probably a second or less. Look at all the traveling waves. In, look at four. High frequency, they're all stuck at the base. In four, may, all the traveling waves are more toward the apex. In four, may, Look at the little tiny traveling waves of the high frequencies. Information. So you've got this, all these rippling traveling waves. And all the time on each traveling wave, you are getting a sharpening that's taking place by the outer hair cells. So here's sensory versus neural hearing loss. Outer hair cells, inner hair cells. Where would this be showing you? Probably at the base of the cochlea where the high frequencies reside because the basilar membrane will be narrowest here. So you've only got three rows of outer hair cells at the base, but at the apex you'd likely have four or five. Again, showing you this picture, outer hair cells, inner hair cells, moving in closer, outer hair cells, inner hair cells, moving in closer, moving in closer, tiny little things, human hair, versus hair cell. And on top of each hair cell, hundreds of stereocilia. So we are talking tiny, tiny. I've shown you this picture here. Here's a bug blown up under an electron microscope. Look at the gear in its claw. Now, if I bring this closer, you'll see a tiny white dot on one of the teeth of the gear. If I bring it in closer, that's a hair cell. And on the hair cell, hundreds of hairs. Back here, back here, just to emphasize how small all of this stuff is. And Can bring you see hair cells on a, like a CAT scan or an MRI? You can't see them. They're too small. They're too small? They're too small. You can see a cochlea on an MRI. You can see the oh. curly Q of the cochlea. Yep. But that's about as close as it gets. That's the, that whole, much. the whole cochlea is about as big as the tip of your little finger. Right, yeah. We are. That's a good question. It just highlights the complexity. Here's inner hair cells. Here's three rows of outer hair cells. Here's inner hair cells, three rows of outer hair cells. Bringing it closer, this is an inner hair cell looking down on the top. So here's the, the tip of the cell like as it sticks up, and here's the small choir boy standing in front and the taller ones and taller ones standing in the back. Here's a picture of an outer hair cell looking from the top. You can see this is the cell, and then you're looking at, again, hundreds of stereocilia on the top, kind of like a W or a V. 
looking at a top view of a hair cell again, inner hair cell. Okay, you can tell it's inner because it's fairly straight. Inner hair cells don't have that V shape. Inner hair cells, sort of like a shallow, a little bit of a bend in the way the stereocilia are. Outer hair cells, outer hair cells, outer hair cells. So this is normal and this is damaged. This is normal, and this is damaged. And note, look where the damage usually is, mostly to the outer hair cells. The inners are not as affected. So this is an analogy, a verbal analogy of this slide and this slide. If we make put this into words, perfect hearing looks like this, and impaired hearing looks like this. And you know what? In my office, when I was practicing, I used to have, and you know what? It, it happens in any language, by the way, even in Chinese, okay? I would have these four slides. I had them laminated and color printed and up like a, like a fourplex, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I had these up in my office, these four slides. Bam, bam, da, da, da. <laughs> And I would try to explain to people that hearing aids are not like glasses. It's not a matter of just sending light to an intact retina. Uh-uh. In this case, the retina, in quotes, of the ear itself is damaged. And that's why hearing aids are called hearing aids. Like a cane for a bad knee. They help, but they don't replace the real McCoy. You can't. And this is the education that we as HISs have to impart to our clients. It's a, I, I, and I show these slides in this talk about inner ear pathology just so that we get a real good sound grip on that cochlea and the type of damage that occurs. Now we can kind of move in to talk about what happens. Here's a passive traveling wave. This is the cochlea unrolled. Here's the base of the cochlea. It's widest, where my cursor is, but you've got, follow me, one row of inner hair cells all along. You'll have three rows of outer hair cells, four rows of outer hair cells, five rows of outer hair cells. Here the guy is hearing a low-pitched tone. The ripple is exciting these hair cells near the apex. So he's, but look at how wide that ripple is. Look at how wide it is. So when he's hearing a tone, there's lots of other ones too. So that, that's, here's what the outer hair cells do. They sharpen it. Not only do they amplify it, but they sharpen it. They pull the traveling wave into a point. So now this guy's got good frequency resolution. It's like his TV is tuned. He hasn't got a lot of static. So this guy can separate frequencies close together. This guy can't. This guy can hear speech in noise pretty good. This guy can't. So when you're putting a hearing aid on this person, you're making a small dull traveling wave into a larger dull traveling wave. It's better, but it hasn't made it perfect. This ain't coming back. Okay, this is gone forever. That's why people hate hearing aids. That's why people complain bitterly about hearing aids. They pick up background noise. That's why hearing aids use directional microphones. And that's why hearing aids use digital noise reduction because they have to compensate for the loss of the sharpness of the traveling wave. So hearing aids have to do two things. They have to amplify, but they also have to sharp, they have to separate speech from background noise. And how do you do that? By increasing the signal to noise ratio. The signal being speech, the noise being the crap. You have to somehow make the speech louder than the background noise so the person with the traveling wave that's dull and rounded can still separate speech from noise. So hearing aids have to provide gain, amplification, but they also have to increase the signal to noise ratio. Gain is a matter of using compression and amplification. Increasing signal to noise ratio is a matter of directional microphones and digital noise reduction. So that's the, again, it's all 
related to hair cells and inner ear pathology. That's why I'm so emphatic about a knowledge of the anatomy and acoustics, because these are fundamentals for understanding everything else. Here's outer hair cells. Here's the tectorial membrane that laid on top. They tore it off. And you can see the imprint. Look at these hairs of the dots. And you can see the imprints. Look at these imprints on the right. So they literally had to tear that tectorial membrane off of the outer hair cells. Look at this slide showing you in motion how the outer hair cells pull that membrane down so that the inner hair cells can get bent. Now this doesn't take place with loud sounds. This is what the outer hair cells are doing with soft sounds. Notice that their hairs are stuck into the underside of that membrane, whereas the inners are not. Just tells you why the outers die first, because they're the moving part. In any system, the moving part dies first. Again, here's a picture out of my little textbook showing you the same thing. Outer hair cells are like long drinks of water. They have test tubes. Outer inner hair cells are fat couch potatoes. They're totally different animals. Otoacoustic emissions, well, we'll talk about that later, but we'll come back to that at the end. But otoacoustic emissions are a byproduct of the outer hair cells working their butts off. This being done here is not for free. Just like a lot of electricity produces heat in a wire, the outer, just like a lot of work produces sweat, well, the outer hair cells working their butts off create otoacoustic emissions. And that's what it says here. OAEs result from outer hair cells working their butts off. And what are otoacoustic emissions? Don't confuse with tinnitus. But they are an actual sound that comes out of the ear. Look at this. Here's a foot plate of the stapes. Here's the middle ear ossicles, and here's the eardrum. And actually, the sound comes out. It's a backward sound. It comes out of the ear. And it's a byproduct of outer hair cells. You, you're supposed to have otoacoustic emissions. If you did not, you have damage to outer hair cells. We don't hear that. We, we don't really hear the autoacoustics. Only no. the instruments pick it up, right? Cor that's correct. And here's why. It's a great question, Kelly. Here's why. Because you're, look at how small the foot plate of the stapes is. Look at how big the eardrum is. Remember when we learned about that the size of the eardrum, I had you put your hand hard against your face and then push your face hard with your finger? Okay? And because when sound hits a big eardrum and that force gets converged onto a point, you increase the sound pressure. Okay. So it's the opposite when it's going but the other way. Exactly. It's the opposite going the other way. And that's why you don't hear your autoacoustic emissions. Thank God. <laughs> yeah, I don't really have complaints. Huh? Oh, man. Talk, talk about weird, okay? Anyway, we will talk about this later on. I'm going to skip through these, but I'll just look at the slide for the hell of it. We've got two weeks to cover this stuff, so we're good. Look at it. They'll have two sounds coming in. You're going to have, it's like a probe tube in tympanometry. It's got three holes. They put the probe in the ear. One sound comes out of one speaker. Another sound comes out of the other speaker. They make the frequencies related, close together. They send them through the ear canal, goes through the middle ear, goes into the cochlea, and the outer hair cells produce a third tone that comes back out through the middle ear, through the ear canal, and it's picked up by the mic. That's how they pick up autoacoustic emissions. Here's a picture of the probe tube in the ear. Two tones, frequency one, frequency two, and your distortion product being produced by the outer hair cells is the purple. Weird, huh? This is what audiologists do at hospitals to check to test babies' hearing. It's one of the ways they do it. Distortion product, autoacoustic emissions. Here's the two tones coming in. And here's that third one coming out. There's other ones that come out too, but this that third one that's the largest that, that's measured. Anyway, this is me. These are my autoacoustic emissions. Now here's the noise floor in my ear canal. And here's my autoacoustic emissions in red. And look at this, all of a sudden they die off in the highs. 
that shows that I'm going to get high frequency hearing loss. My high frequency outer hair cells are dying. See? So it's typical. It's like OAEs can predict hearing loss. Anyway, we will talk about that later. Let's move on over here to where, where are we now? Let's get move on to uh, oh yeah, hereditary types of hearing loss. Top of page two. And this is called, we'll talk about Mondini syndrome. Mondini syndrome. The cochlea does not have all two and a half turns. Here's Mondini. Have a look. See how the cochlea does not have two and a half turns? It's missing. Here, you got two and a half turns. Here, you do not. Mondini is a type of incomplete development with malformation of the cochlea from a patient with trisomy, blah, 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 blah. Note, incompletely developed cochlea with absence of blah, 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 blah. So here's another one. Here's ototoxicity. Ototoxicity. Now, we're jumping a bit here. We're on the middle of page two. Have a look here. Middle of page two, ototoxicity. Let's cover this. Often causes high frequency hearing loss, outer hair cell pathology, and then it goes to inner. And read what it says on page two in your notes. It's caused by antibiotics. And then these antibiotics are known as, and I'll scroll down here, aminoglycosides. Circle that word, aminoglycosides. And look at how all these words end. Neomycin, canamycin, streptomycin, viomycin, gentamycin, all the mycins. They cause permanent hair cell damage in either the vestibular system or the cochlea or both. Look what else it says there. Erythromycin is not one of those. Erythromycin is commonly given as a topical ointment for outer ear infections and stuff like that. Don't worry about that one, okay? But what's the family of drugs? They are, they are, older, they are antibiotics, and they're called aminoglycosides, and they are oto-ear toxic, okay? Look at the next one, quinine. Quinine, given for malaria. It causes high-frequency tinnitus, causes hearing loss, so these old soldiers that were stationed. I was going to say, I, the, the soldiers, that's why they get tinnitus, is because they're given this when they go overseas, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. All right. Because that's probably why my stepdad has it so bad. Because Could be. Because was in the service. Could very well be. Yep. Aspirin. Yeah. Check this one out. Aspirin. Now, aspirin is the most common drug taken in the world. It's good for fevers. It's good for a lot of things. It's good for arthritis. It's a blood thinner. It's a, it's a stroke preventer. But it causes tinnitus. You're going to get a lot of elderly people in your office. And when they complain about tinnitus, this is why we ask what medications they're taking. You can't take them off their aspirin because the doctor has put them on the aspirin. But at least they know why then they have a ring, ringing in the ear. It's caused by, tin, by the aspirin. Now, if they stop taking the aspirin, the, the, the tinnitus goes away. And it does not cause hearing loss. Okay, the aspirin just causes some excessive ringing in the ear. Ototoxicity is often first noticed for the high frequencies. Physicians who prescribe ototoxic meds sometimes have time before the hearing loss can invade the speech frequencies, but it's really ultra high frequency audiometry requires testing above 8,000 hertz, and it's not normally done in clinic. At any rate, ototoxicity, know about it. It's there. It's a reality. If we move on up our page, you'll see postnatal causes, and these are these are less common causes, and I'm, I'm sweeping these out so that we can address the common ones, okay? Sometimes otitis media can result in additional cochlear damage. The result is a mixed hearing loss. That can be repeated bouts of severe 
otitis media that have now begun to infect a little bit of the cochlea itself, but that's rare. <laughs> Otosclerosis sometimes, uh, you know, can, can involve the cochlea and bone conduction as well, but we covered last week, remember, Carhartt's notch does not truly indicate hair cell loss, okay? Just remember, make sure that we have this down. Another rare cause is meningitis. Meningitis is an inflammation of the meninges. What's the meninges? Well, that's the outside layer of the brain. You have a sac or a, a thin membrane that covers the brain. And underneath that membrane is cerebral spinal fluid. If that area surrounding the outer edge of the brain gets infected, that's the meninges. That's the meningitis, inflammation of the meninges. That can cause total deafness. The labyrinths fill with pus. Then as infection heals, the labyrinth fills with bone. There goes your hair cells. Measles, rubella, rubiola, okay? German measles with mum can go, can pass on to the baby, hearing loss, but even getting the measles yourself, a 10-day variety of rubella can cause more sensory neural than the rubella, than rubella for the person who gets it. Mumps, getting the mumps can cause unilateral sensory neural loss. It's a weird one, unilateral. Are these because you run a fever with these? Yep, yeah, likely, normally? yep, likely. And here's one, labyrinthitis. Well, that's just an inflammation inside the cochlea. Now, if it's viral, you're going to have dizzy spells, you're going to have temporary hearing loss, but if it's bacterial, say sayonara to that ear, it's gone. Vir viruses are different than germs. Germs are much larger. Viruses are tiny, 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 tiny. Flu is a virus. Cold is a virus. But an actual lung infection, like pneumonia, that gets bacterial. That, that's when you're coughing up phlegm and, and pus. As soon as you've got pus in the picture, it's, 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 it's germs, it's bacteria. But uh, viruses, it's, it's different. Now you've looked at, but these are more rare causes. Phototoxicity is not all that common. Not really. Here's the big one. Here we go. We will break down presbycusis today. Okay? It's by far the most common cause of hearing loss. Begins at age 65. Look what it says here. 30% of people over 65 have sensory neural loss. 50% of people over 75 have sens sensory neural loss. So one in two people, 75 plus, has significant hearing loss. And you notice that all the time. You're walking down the street and you might, this, you know, something happens and the, the elderly person just doesn't hear it. It's just, or you might talk to the person and the person just doesn't hear you until you tap him on the shoulder. And he's not wearing hearing aids either. It's just common. It's like, and it's not, doesn't mean the person lived a bad life or whatever. Let me tell you a story about presbycusis. I'm going to stop sharing screen here so we can really concentrate on this. Presbycusis hits the day you're born. We hear from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz at birth. By the time you are 10 years old, you can't hear 20,000 hertz anymore. By the time you're 20, you can't hear 18,000 hertz anymore. By the time you're 30, you can't hear 17,000 anymore. And 40 and 50. And by the time you're 65, now the hearing loss has invaded 8,000 hertz and 4,000 hertz. Think of presbycusis as a long-term loss of high-frequency hearing. Gradual until at 65 plus, now it invades the audiometric test frequencies. That's how we need to think about presbycusis. That's why the guy in Wales, England, he invented something called the mosquito. 
And the mosquito was a spe it, it, it exists. You, if you look up on the internet after this talk is done, look up mosquito and hearing. <laughs> I don't think this is hilarious. A guy made a speaker outside his drugstore. He didn't want the kids hanging around this drugstore. He just hated these kids smoking pot or smoking cigarettes hanging out of his drugstore. So he made a mosquito. It emitted a 15,000 hertz tone. Well, the adults can't hear it. But the kids are like, oh, what the hell is that? Oh, let's get out of here, man. <laughs> so the, the, the effectiveness of the mosquito was noticed by the sudden absence of teenagers hanging around the drugstore. <laughs> Do you patent it? <laughs> it is. It's patented. It's patented? Yeah, yeah. smart guy. <laughs> I think it's hilarious. I think it's just... It's diabolical. Like, who comes up with stuff like that? It just, but I, to me, that fits right in with the topic of presbycusis. It's perfect. Because the adults who don't have presbycusis still can't hear the mosquito, whereas the kids can. So it's a, but it doesn't matter for speech. It's not going to affect your speech frequencies at all. <laughs> oh, got to love it. So when you're reading about presbycusis, Obviously, it has to affect more than just the cochlea. The whole central auditory nervous system ages. The whole body becomes older. Ossicles and cochlear windows and central auditory nervous system, cochlear windows being oval window, round window. Look at what Jurger says here. Jurger recommends fitting the very elderly, 85 plus, with one hearing aid not to. This is significant. There's too many people out there who are always fitting binaurally. When you become 90 years old and you're wearing hearing aids for the first time, that person's central auditory nervous system, brain stem, where crossover takes place, that's also got presbycusis. Really, the person can't handle binaural amplification. It's too much. It may be wise to fit a very elderly person with one hearing aid. Are you right-handed? Let's go with that one. You know? But make sure you, you also fit that person with hearing aids that don't require batteries, that use, what do you call it, uh, rechargeable batteries and there's lots of companies that are now into rechargeable batteries because the person's got trouble changing the tiny batteries with because manual dexterity is a problem and so's vision so you have to think about these things okay term phonemic regression is just difficulty in word recognition blah 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 audiogram is usually mild to moderate Sloping more to loss in the highs. What type of tympanograms? Type A, normal. Normal static compliance, which is the height of the tympanogram. Acoustic reflexes will be present, usually at reduced sensation levels, but present. And as we move here, this is how we will generally close today. Look at these four classic types of presbycusis. There's four classic types. And this is written by a guy or discovered or written about by someone by the last name of Schuknecht. Remember the name. Schuknecht was an MD, an ear, nose, and throat physician, and he did a study. And he did a study on, and I'll stop sharing here for a second. Schuknecht is a big name in the field of audiology. What he did was... He, he, he examined the cochleas of hundreds of elderly people who had passed away. So they all had hearing tests done. So what he did was he took, he took their audiograms, and then he would examine, he would go into the head, and he would look at the cochlea. And he would look at what type of damage took place in that cochlea. And he would associate it with the audiogram. And then he took another audiogram and he did open the head of that person and looked at the, at the uh, hair cells and the cochlea and, it, and another audiogram. And he was matching the audiograms with the particular types of cochlear pathology. And he broke it down. He said, you know what? When I'm seeing mild to moderate sloping loss and 80% speech discrimination, 
when I look in that person's cochlea, I see mostly damage to outer hair cells. When I look at someone, though, who's got bad speech discrimination, kind of like 50%, and I seem to see in that person's cochlea damage to both sets of hair cells. Hmm. Even if the hearing loss was the same, even if the loss was the same from one person to another. So this is the guy that came up with the, the particular pathology. And then he would look in, the, in uh, audiograms that were fairly flat, not sloping. They didn't have that downward slope. They were fairly flat. And this was mostly women. More women had this than men. And he would look at this and go, hmm, the damage. I also see damage to the stria vascularis, the blood supply to the cochlear hair cells. Now, when you've got damage to the blood supply of the hair cells, your damage to the hair cells is going to be fairly even, Stephen, across the frequencies. It's going to be a flat audiogram. Women, elderly women, tend to have a flatter hearing loss than elderly men. Elderly men tend to have better hearing than elderly women do in the low frequencies, but elderly men also have worse hearing in the high frequencies than elderly women. That's because more men have been exposed to noise. So men tend to have a combination of presbycusis and noise-induced hearing loss, whereas women don't. And women are also slightly more susceptible to heart and stroke disease. So women will have more problems with blood supply to the cochlea, which will cause a more even Stephen damage across the hair cell range. So this is also a study done by Jurger comparing hearing loss in females versus males. You will tend to notice this. This isn't always the case, but it's often the case. It's, it's something to note. So back to sharing screen here. Reading our four classic types of hearing loss, right from the top. Sensory presbycusis, outer hair cell damage, <clears throat> right there. Okay. Outer hair cell damage, especially around the high frequencies, the basal turn of the cochlea, the wide turn. And you know what I always say? I use this analogy. The carpet in front of the door gets dirty first. That's why you have a doormat. Well, all traveling waves start at the base of the cochlea, don't they? They either start at the base and end at the base, or they start at the base and end in the middle, or they start at the base and they end at the apex. But by gum, they all start at the base. Couldn't it just be by reason of analogy? Then we have wear out first. Yeah. Just that I guess that's a that's a, like a, a, a handy kind of like a, a, a verbal analogy of it. The audiogram shows high frequency loss, decent word discrimination. I should have had that in there. Fair speech discrim, neural presbycusis. Now you've got eighth nerve neurons in the cochlea. And what does the eighth nerve attach to? Inner hair cells. Inner hair cells are what's attached to the eighth nerve. Outers, not so much. Remember, we're talking the afferent root, AFF, brain going, not the efferent, which is back to body from brain going, okay? <clears throat> Speech discrimination is poor. Some say it's a fairly flat audiogram with slightly worse hearing in the highs because the hearing loss is getting worse now. You've got more, you've got outer happen first. Now you're getting inner. <clears throat> so poor speech discrimination. Strial presbycusis, atrophy of the stria vascularis in the middle and apical turns of the cochlea. Fairly flat audiogram with fair speech discrimination. An ad slightly more common in women than in men. And then the fourth type is kind of like a, a, what do you call it? a garbage can. It, it's the other ones, the, the presbycusis that's not, that doesn't fit into to the prior three mentioned. <laughs> and think of it as this, cochlear conductive presbycusis. 
think of it as aging of the cochlear partitions, aging of the basal or membrane itself, aging of the, of the uh, uh, Reissner's membrane. It's a mechanical phenomenon. But by far the most common is, number one, sensory. Sensory and strial are pretty common. Neural is just, again, I, I highlight these to break down the differences between sensory and neural. Remember the term sensory neural. Sensory neural, outer, sensory, neural, inner. All righty roo. We'll stop at this particular section here. We'll go into noise induced hearing loss next week. And noise induced hearing loss, we will follow that. Okay, we'll cover noise-induced loss fairly, fairly deep. And then we'll talk about sudden idiopathic deafness. Sudden, like it just all of a sudden the person goes deaf in one ear. That happens to adults. and They don't know exactly why that is. Meniere's disease. Meniere's, less, not, not so common, but it's a bad one. Head trauma. And then we will finish with what's called cochlear dead spots. Cochlear dead regions. Now, if I'm showing the PowerPoint here, we've got ototoxicity. We talked about that earlier. We talk, here's hair cells again, normal, outers, damage to outers, normal, damage to outers. Typical presbycusis, usually sensory, outer hair cell damage. This is showing you thresholds in decibels by men, for men by age group. They're just showing you older and older and older. The loss is occurring more and more and more in the highs. Showing you tympanograms that would occur, that accompany presbycusis. Well, the only one that would be the one is type A, normal. They have nothing wrong with the middle ear. We talked about how once the hearing loss gets to be more than about 60 dB, all of a sudden you've got a huge incidence of absent acoustic reflexes. We covered that last week and the week before. Acoustic reflexes, we don't need to cover that. We did that last week, last week. But it's tie it together with speech discrimination. Acoustic reflex deals with inner hair cells. Remember the acoustic reflex arc? Autoacoustic emissions deal with the outer hair cells. So now we've got two non-behavioral tests, two of them. One's acoustic reflex. That deals with the inner hair cells. The other one's autoacoustic emissions. That tests the outer hair cells. And you know what? Both of these are obliterated by middle ear pathology. And that is why they are good cross tests. So now we have two non-behavioral tests that accurately, that can assess the integrity of the separate hair cell populations. Acoustic reflexes are an inner hair cell phenomenon. Autoacoustic emissions are an outer hair cell phenomenon. Two people with the same moderate sensory neural loss may have very different speech discrimination. The one with good speech discrimination probably has acoustic reflexes. The one with the poor speech discrimination probably has absent acoustic reflexes. This guy on the top is sensory. The person on the bottom has more neural involvement inner hair cells. Acoustic reflexes, hair cells, and speech discrimination. Again, just this slide's just talking about the very same thing. Speech discrimination, usually you're going to, when you've got sensory loss, your speech discrimination is never going to be 100%. It may be pretty good though, not bad. These are called PI functions, performance index functions, and they're just to show you how your speech discrimination is. This one here is kind of interesting. I'll just talk about this. I'm not going to ask about anything about this on a final, so don't worry about it. I'm just talking, talking here because I got like one minute left, so I'm going to blow it. So this is talking about if the guy's got normal hearing and you came in and talked at 10 dB or so where my arrow is, he's going to get none of the words. If he's got normal hearing and you talk at about 25 dB or 30, he's going to get about 60%. He's going to get some of the words. If he's got normal hearing and you come in at 40 dB, he's going to get almost all the words. Okay? That's all it's telling you. And here is the person with some sensory neural loss. As you get more intense, he's going to do better and better, but he's going to peak out. 
You won't ever get 100%. That's all that's showing you. And the person here has eighth nerve tumor. You, as you get more intense, it gets better and better. But as you get louder, it gets worse. That's called rollover, retrocochlear pathology. We'll cover that in two weeks when we're looking at eighth nerve pathology. This was just sort of a heads up. You know, my sister with the cookie yeah. bite, uh, hearing loss, she yeah. had extremely good speech recognition score. Yeah, you know why? Because she's got good high frequency hearing. Yeah, she was like, I go, well, your speech work. and But when... Uh, Jessica put the hearing aid in her for to see what she was losing. My sister said she could see the difference. Oh yeah. So yeah. They didn't do any type of acoustic retouch. Uh, she works at um, Sam's Club, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, the test that my sister sent me showed the audiogram and the speech recognition, mm -hmm. but it didn't show any uh, acoustic reflex testing or uh, any of that. No, had she been seen by an audiologist, more than likely that would have been done. I would, I would be doing it out of interest just to kind of learn yeah. more about her hearing loss. But yeah, because being that it's, I, I don't know how many Jessica's seen like that where she works, you know. Yeah. But uh, when my sister told me, I said, yeah, there's, that's not a real common type. No, it's not. Of, of hearing loss. No, it's so a then rare... when I got all this, I texted her and told her. <laughs> <laughs> Good. So I'm curious on mine if I have, you know, because I think I do probably have some hearing loss, but I've, I've not been tested for 10 years or so. Well, you'll have to check it out sometime. I'm, yeah. my, my hearing isn't perfect either. I've got high frequency loss at 4,000 hertz, a little bit, yeah. about 20, 20 to 30. Yeah. yeah. Nothing to write home about, but uh, my time's coming. <laughs> <laughs> I think all of us are, right? Yeah. Outer hair cell loss would result in sensory loss. Oh, yeah, two days ago, June 30th, I turned 62. Oh. <laughs> yeah, big events in Ted's little life. If the loss were up was, was, to, was due to the inner hair cells, it would result in inner uh, in neural. <coughs> Excuse me. So here's typical presbycusis. And filling in the dots here. Have a look here. Let's fill in what we can just for fun, and then we'll call it sayonara. Have a look. What do you think her SRTs are going to be? Right ear, left ear. So we look at this. We look at the pure tone average. They're going to be. They're going to be all right. Yeah. This well, it's forty to fifty in this the speech range. Yeah. But yeah, maybe a little. Remember what SRT is? The softest that she can hear oh, on words. Okay. Okay. That's discrimination. It's going to be. Yeah. It's, it's going to be equal to the pure tone average, which is about forty-ish. 40, okay. 40, 45, 40, whatever, 35 to 45. What do you think her MCL, most comfortable loudness levels? If she's I mean, never... No, that doesn't change with presbycusis normally. It's usually... Well, yeah, yeah, you're right. The funny thing is, if she's never worn hearing aids, her MCLs are going to be fairly normal. Like she's going to have an MCL of around 60. Mm -hmm. And that's what a normal hearing person's MCL is. And so this person is used to hearing sounds soft, has become accustomed to hearing like, ah. yeah, so that true. person's MCL will be artificially low. And then when you do word discrimination at MCL, single syllable words, say the word cow, say the word tree, say the word cup, she's going to do fairly poor. So, because it's going to be low, low, low to her, right? Yes. And that's why I have speech discrim one and speech discrim two. Because I'll oh, do yeah. speech discrimination a second time at MCL plus 10. I'll come in at 70 instead of at 60. And I'll watch the lines around her eyes crease as she smiles as she's doing better. <laughs> and that's a counseling tool for using hearing aids. That's how you sell hearing aids. Oh, with that speech discrimination, yes. you can show them that this is what you're hearing it at. Yes. And, and, and with this little bit of amplification, yes, you're going to do how much better you hear. Yeah, gotcha. precisely. Gotcha. <laughs> and look at the UCLs, uncomfortable loudness. It's going to be, what do you think? 100, 110. That doesn't yeah. normally change. Yep, yeah, that not, doesn't normally change that much. Yeah. What do you think of type, what type of tympanograms would you suspect? Normal, type yeah. A.
type A, correct? Acoustic reflexes would kick in at regular levels around 100, 105, 110, 895, who knows, but you'll have them. Anyway, all right, we be done. I will stop sharing screen here and we'll sign off for today. Come on, coming on back in at uh, next week, Tuesday at 1130. Okay. Are we going to... Are you going to do a catch up? Are you going to do two in one week? Have you decided? I'm thinking so far we may get away with not doing that. Okay. We may get away with it, but I will keep everyone tuned with remind and email. I always do things three ways. I make the announcement and then I send out an email to everybody and then I send out a remind. There's always bam, bam, bam. <laughs> Just to make sure people cover get it. all your bases that way. Might as well. <laughs> yep. All right, Kelly, have a good week. Okay, you too. Have, have a good, good Fourth of July tomorrow. Thanks. Canada turned 150 on June, for June, July 1st. It was Big Bad Canada Day here. Everything was red and white. Everybody was going nuts. <laughs> anyway, see you later. We'll see you. Have a good Bye. one. You too.